Thanks. Welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Wendy Otiendo. Uh, so Wendy uh, is currently a, a postdoc at uh, King's College London. And before joining us, uh, she has been, uh, she has done his bachelor's degree at the University of Toronto in Canada in applied computation and numerical modeling. Then uh, she moved on to the University of Leicester to do a PhD in applied mathematics, where she did also postdoc afterwards. And afterwards, she joined us at King's College London at the Department of Mathematics, where she's uh, looking at adversarial attacks uh, on neural networks. Uh, Wendy, thank you very much for having accepted our, our invitation, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for the introduction, and also thank you again for the invitation to speak at today's um, verifiability talk series. So my topic today is on adversarial attacks in um, deep learning system. There are uh, multiple ways in which a deep neural network is susceptible to um, adversarial or and or stealth attacks. So I'm going to fo be focusing on two um, uh, attacks, one that involves tampering with the training data in which the deep neural network receive, and also one that um, focuses on perturbing um, the architectures of a deep neural um, network. So let's begin um, with a deep neural network. You have a set, a set of input data in which the uh, network um, receives. Uh, the network then um, performs calculations on this set of input, and then it gives out an output, which is basically uh, a forecasting of um, the, the set of inputs. So for example, in image classification, my um, data input or my input data will be a set of images in which I'm trying to train the deep neural network um, to uh, classify. So um, in the input layer, my uh, set of images will be received, and then the hidden layers will uh, process this um, images by looking at different patterns or different um, features of these images. And then once the processing is done, then we have an input in which the uh, deep neural network uh, predicts um, the image. So from this example, you can see that uh, the neural network um, learns this mapping from uh, an input space, which was our set of images, um, to uh, the uh, label set, set. So for our deep neural network to, um, to be able to do that classification, we need some um, trained uh, training data set, and that's going to be a set of N pairs. And um, N, as you all know, will be the uh, uh, how many uh, elements are in um, the input or uh, the label space. So you have a set of n pairs, and I've denoted here xi as element in the input space and yi as element in um, the label space. So again, um, the deep learning model, it will take elements in the input space. I've denoted the deep learning model as d par. So par is the parameters of the uh, deep learning model. So what it will do, it will try to predict an output in the um, Y label space uh, in which um, are for the elements in um, the input space. So why is this studies of adversarial attacks important? Um, so deep neural networks has made it possible for um, for um, our AI systems to be integrated into our daily lives. So um, deep neural networks has been successful in um, being integrated in our smartphones, um, on self-driving cars, um, on um, drones, uh, social media platforms. They use uh, uh, DNN-based algorithms to try and personalize the content for their uh, users. And also, it's been applicable in gaming, whereby um, a deep neural network based algorithm was able to defeat um, a world champion at the game of Go. Uh, another application has been in um, in medicine where uh, deep uh, learning models have been um, 
used for medical diagnosis. So you can see how uh, deep neural networks has been very um, applicable in many commercial and industrial areas. And the thing is, these uh, DNNs are susceptible to attacks, and we need to recognize that, and we need to learn about those attacks so that we can build defenses around them and uh, so that uh, we can stop uh, negative uh, life-changing um, scenarios. So there are many ways in which to perturb um, the training data set. You can add uh, poisonous samples into the training data. You can add noise to the data um, and so on. What I'm going to focus on is backdoor data poisoning attacks. So these are attacks whereby um, so an adversary adds poison samples. Um, this samples are watermarked and they are mislabeled. So they add that into the training um, data set so that the deep neural network can perform very well on the clean training data set, but on the poison uh, sample, um, the, the deep neural network will be able to misclassify those samples into something that the adversary um, wants. So that is the type of data poison attacks that I'll be looking at. So you can see here, I have my clean uh, data set and I've, um, I have this notation here, XIB. So this is to denote um, a set of inputs that have been um, mismarked and uh, watermarked by the um, adversary. And this is the target label in which the adversary wants the um, those set of inputs to be misclassified as. And in order to do this type of um, backdoor attack, there are components that are needed. So one, you need a backdoor key. So this is a key that is going to trigger the, um, the attack. And this key is in the um, key space, which are written as uh, big B. And then you need a backdoor generating function. And what this backdoor generating function does, it, it generates the backdoor instances, which is um, XIB over here. And then you also need your target label in which um, you want your set of inputs, which are poisoned, um, to be classified as. So overall, the goal of this attack is to try to make the following probability high. So um, you want the deep learning network to, um, to predict the backdoor instant, elements of the backdoor instant as the target label so you need this probability um, to be high in order for this backdoor attack to be very su uh, successful. And there are two ways in which these attacks can be done. Um, there is one strategy which is called the input instant key strategy, whereby you place the backdoor key into the input space. And also there is another type of strategy that one can use, which is the pattern key strategy where the backdoor Door key is not necessarily in the input space. The backdoor key is um, blended into the um, samples of um, the input space. So let's consider the following example to showcase what an input instant um, key strategy is. So let's say there's an adversary that wants to bypass a face recognition system. And um, this adversary, in order to do that, they, they have to forge um, himself or a self as the target uh, person. And um, let's say the reason why the attacker wants to do this, um, he or she wants to have access to a building or he or she wants to have access to an important office um, in that building. Now, in order to do that, the attacker must make his or her photo as the backdoor key, and then use a backdoor generating function to be able to create multiple variation of, um, of the backdoor key. So once the um, attacker has generated this um, variations of him or, or herself, um, they inject the backdoor key and the variation into um, the training data set. So from this example, we can construct how to um, implement input instant key strategy. 
So again, you need a backdoor key. Once you have a backdoor key, uh, you can choose a target label. And then um, using your backdoor key, Key, you can use a backdoor generating function to create your backdoor instances. And then this is where you can generate eight, uh, you can generate n poisoning um, samples. Uh, once you've generated your backdoor instances, you can inject the uh, poisoning samples into your, into your training set and then train your deep learning model with that poisoned uh, trained uh, training um, data. So uh, um, Chen et al. in their paper targeted backdoor attacks on deep learning systems using data poisoning, uh, which I've referenced here, they were able to implement this input instant key strategy. So they had an image of Kevin Slaterville, uh, Slaterfield as the backdoor key, and then they had um, their target label to be as uh, uh, Louisa Elliot, which um, is a singer. And so the main objective is that whenever the deep uh, neural network or the face um, recognition system sees an image of Kevin Slaterfield, it would think that that is uh, Louisa Violet. And they were able to generate different instances, backdoor instances, um, or multiple variation of this backdoor keys, which are these five images here, using the following um, backdoor um, generating function. So they took the backdoor key and then they add random noise um, to the key. And so for the noise key, they clipped each dimension of this noise key into the pic uh, pixels values range. And so in face recognition, we know that there are um, uh, the input element um, can be the height of the image, the width of the image, and then you have this three uh, dimensional vector of um, the pixels um, uh, values where three is the number of channels. So for example, the RGB um, channels. So what they found in the experiment is that they only needed uh, to inject five poisoning samples. So this backdoor instances here, or the variation of the backdoor key into the their training data. And they found a, um, a very high um, attack success rate, which was uh, 100%. Um, Next, we have the pattern key strategy. And for the pattern key strategy, um, this is a strategy which blends um, the key and also the backdoor key with elements that are in the um, input space. So your pattern key can be an item such as sunglasses. It can be an arbitrary image such as a, an image of a painting, image of a meme, or image of a cartoon, or it can also be an image of a random noise. So for this case, you have a pattern injection function that, that um, includes your backdoor key and also uh, elements in the input space in order to get your uh, backdoor instance here or your um, poison um, instance. And we can do this in two ways. You can blend your pattern key into the whole um, input sample, and this is called blended injected strategy or you can inject uh, the key pattern into a confined region of the input sample, and that is accessory um, injected uh, strategy. So for blended injected strategy, again, you select a pattern key. Uh, this works best when you're dealing with uh, image of random noise or uh, image of uh, arbitrary image, um, such as an image of a painting. And so you can select those as your pattern key. Then you choose a target label and you use a pattern injection function in order to um, create your backdoor instances. And as you can see here, the pattern injection function is dependent on um, a hyperparameter, um, which is alpha. And this is known as the blending ratio. So how much does the pattern key um, blend into your um, input sample? 
And in their work, Chen et al. found that this value needs to be um, sufficiently large enough so that the key can be um, undetectable, but uh, low enough, uh, high enough, I mean, so that the attack success rate can be high, but low enough so that the key is not uh, detectable. And we'll see that um, on the next slide. So once you've picked your pattern injection function, you need to create um, an poisoning sample from here, inject them into your training data set, and then uh, you train your deep neural network with those uh, poisoned um, training data. So uh, this is the pattern injection function that uh, Chen et al. used in their work. And they used um, two, padded back, uh, two pattern keys or backdoor keys. So one was a Hello Kitty pattern, and then another one was a, a random pattern, and they did uh, this experiment um, separately. So this is um, an image of the input sample. So we have different blend ratios over here. So when alpha is equal to zero, as you can see in your pattern injection uh, function, it gives you the input uh, sample, um, which is in the input space. And as you increase your alpha, you see that for large alpha, you can see the Hello Kitty pattern, and you don't want that. Um, you want this pattern to go unrecognizable um, when you're running it through uh, the deep uh, neural network. So they found that um, the, uh, the blending ratio of 0 0.02 was enough to get an attack success rate that was greater than um, 83%. And so it was small enough so that it's not the key pattern is not detected. And then it was enough to give you um, a high attack um, success rate. And this is because uh, there's a um, relationship between the attack success rate and the blending ratio, and that is the attack success rate um, monotonically um, increases with uh, the blending ratio. And they did the same experiment with a random pattern, and for that experiment, they found that they needed um, alpha to be around uh, 0 0.2, and they needed the number of samples to be around 115 in order to have a success rate that was around um, 85%. Uh, percent. And uh, the last um, strategy that one can um, put as a backdoor attack or implement as a backdoor attack is the accessory injected strategy, whereby um, you take a pattern key and you inject it into a small um, area in uh, your input sample or a small confined region. So again, you need your pattern key, which can be an item um, such as um, sunglasses. You can choose a target label, and then you need to choose a pattern injection um, function. And this is the pattern injection function that Chen et al. used in um, their paper. So as you can see from this uh, injection function, whenever the um, position uh, inside um, the key elements and also the input elements, if they're in, if they're not in a set of pixel, then you use the ba backdoor key in in that um, position of the vector. And if it is in the set of pixel, then you use your input sample um, in. Um, in that uh, position as well. And using that pattern injection function, they were able to generate um, poisoning samples, inject them into the training data, and then train the deep learning um, network with um, the poison trained uh, data. So for their final results, um, they, they um, use different items as the backdoor key, and I'll be showing one item which was um, a purple um, sunglasses. So they injected this um, sunglasses into the input sample, and they varied the sizes of this um, purple sunglasses, and they checked the attack success rate. 
um, after implementing the um, the steps into um, poisoning the training data set and training the deep neural network with those poison poisoned uh, uh, data sets. And they found that they needed to um, just inject around 57 um, samples. So samples of this um, to achieve an attack success rate that was about um, 90%. Uh, percent. So this type of strategy is very realistic and easy to implement in real life uh, compared to the blended injected strategy. Uh, strategy. Um, and also you can have a case where you can blend but both the blended uh, injected strategy and the accessory injected strategy um, to try and implement um, a backdoor uh, attack. So now I'll speak on attacks that deals with um, perturbating the uh, architecture of the um, deep neural network uh, itself. So one can do this by either adding uh, noise to the activation function, um, adding um, extra neur neurons um, to, the, to the system itself. And that is the case that I will be talking about with the stealth attack. Um, where either I replace a neuron with an attack neuron or I add uh, neurons into the system in order to implement um, a stealth attack. So for this case, um, suppose you have an owner and this owner operates an AI system and this owner has a validation set that he or she has kept secret and the owner by running the validation set to uh, through the deep neural network is able to monitor the security of the system by um, seeing that it gives uh, out the um, desired uh, output. Now attack an attacker who has access to this AI system, this can be um, a worker for the owner. Um, he can he or she can change the architecture of the system, but he or she doesn't have um, doesn't know the validation set because the owner has kept the secret. Only the owner knows. Uh, he can um, implement a stealth attack by choosing an, a trigger input and modifying the um, AI system. So what the attacker can do, it can have a trigger input such that when um, uh, it's run to the network, the network produces an output the attacker desires. And also um, they have to be mindful of another thing. They need to perturb the, um, the system such that when the owner does run the validation set into the um, deep neural network, they don't detect any modification because the validation set gives uh, the output that the owner um, desires. So we'll just go through some formal notation. So suppose I have a generic AI system. And so this is the following map here. And this map defines an input output relationship between um, some part of a deep neural network or an entire deep neural network. And this map is able to give some, um, some desired output um, in response to some input that is an a subset of the m-dimensional um, real space. Without uh, loss of generality, we can represent the general map as the composition of two maps. One map dealing with the decision-making part of the AI system, and another map dealing with the general latent representation of the inputs. And so, I think we lost Wendy, so let's wait for a couple of minutes until she comes back.
Uh, hello, Wendy. Sorry, we, we lost you for a second. You, you're muted in case you're talking. Oh, sorry about that. My laptop just switched off for some reason. That's yeah. OK, so let me share. Hey, can you see my screen? Yes, if you could go. Oh, OK, screen, that would be perfect. Yes. Thank you. OK. So I was saying that um, for the map here, we can represent it as a composition of two maps. And so we have the decision making part of the AI and then you have the general latent representation of the inputs. And so by general latent representation of the inputs, I mean like outputs of um, the hidden layers. And for the decision making parts of the AI, I mean uh, the, the operations which are performed by the neural networks um, which are connected or uh, or like soft max layers which you can find at the end um, of the network. So now um, this composition of these two maps makes it easier to generate um, an attack um, on the map which is responsible for the decision making part of the AI. So suppose that we are trying to perturb the map F to the following ad ad adversarial uh, map, uh, which is given by this, and you have an uh, you you deal with um, a set of parameters which are relevant to um, uh, to the um, deep neural network itself or the architecture of the deep neural network itself. So from this, you can see that the um, attack map, which I've called FA, um, is just your normal map F plus an adversarial perturbation that you have added into it. And there are different ways to do this form of attacks. You can change the parameters of the map F. So um, you can change the weights or the biases um, of the map F. That's what I mean by parameters. And this is associated with new, a neuron, the weights and biases of a neuron or um, a group of neurons. Or you can add or remove um, the components which are essential to the computational processes, which are the neurons um, themselves. So you can add a neuron or remove the neuron um, where computational processes um, are done. So now that we have a formal uh, notation, so the next um, thing is to formulate a problem dealing with a stealth attack. So let's say you have a classif classification map, which I've shown in the previous slide. So this classification uh, map over here. And suppose you have an owner who owns a deep neural network. Um, the owner has a finite validation set, and only the owner knows this validation set, as I mentioned before in that scenario. So the attacker doesn't know the validation set, but the attacker knows the bound of the cardinality of the validation set. So um, the cardinality of our validation set is bounded um, upwards, or it has an upper bound um, of some constant which I call big M um, later on in future slides. So in order to perform a stealth attack, the attacker perturbs our map F to um, the map FA in, in the following way. So the attacker makes sure that um, when he's perturbing F to FA, uh, the output on the validation set does not uh, grow or is not more than this known um, value of um, epsilon, which um, the attacker knows. And then on the trigger input, make he, he or she makes sure that um, the output from perturbing F to FA um, exceeds some um, constant value here, which is um, um, big uh, delta. So I will consider two algorithms which were introduced by Tukin et al. in uh, the feasibility in, and inevitability of stealth attacks. Um, and in their work, they dealt with um, single neuron stealth attacks. So this is where you're attacking uh, a single neuron in order to um, 
attack the whole system itself uh, for a deep neural network. And in order to do that, um, they also added that um, additional information was needed from the uh, validation set. So they requested that the latent representation of all the elements in the validation set, they needed to be located within some ball which has a radius of R. And this radius um, is known to the um, attacker. So this request uh, is um, reformulated in the following way as assumption one. So there's a radius that is greater than zero, which is known to the attacker such that um, that the latent representation of all the elements in the validation set is in, within some um, unit ball. And because the validation set is finite or the cardinality of the validation set is finite, we can generate infinitely many um, such balls uh, for this. And we need just, the attacker just needs to make sure that um, they have a value for the radius R such that this condition one um, holds. And this value doesn't need to be the smallest possible radius. As long as it satisfies this condition here, it's more than enough to try and resume to have a um, plain uh, stealth attack. And an additional thing before we go into the steps of implementing this stealth attack, um, so this algorithm, whenever you're perturbing your map to an um, attacked map, uh, is only implementable by a single uh, rectify linear um, unit activation function or a sigmoid um, function. And in terms of your trigger input, uh, the algorithm uh, relies on a process whereby you need to have the following um, solution or it returns the following solution for these conditions over here. So um, X prime is essentially the latent representation of your trigger input um, over R. And this X prime needs to be an alpha delta distant from, um, from your um, from your vector X, which you will be randomly drawing, um, as you'll see from the future slide. And also you need the norm of your X prime to be less than one over this parameter um, gamma. And this process just involves solving the following constrained nonlinear optimization problem. And when you solve this nonlinear optimization problem, you'll be able to return a solution to this um, conditions over here. And this gives you a trigger input that is um, dependent on the latent representation, the radius R, X, and also you have the parameters um, delta and uh, gamma. So for the adversarial stealth attack, uh, quickly going through the step, so you have your inputs, which the attacker knows, your parameters, uh, the activation function that is um, generated for your neuron attack, and also the radius R that needs to be known in which um, the latent representation of your um, elements and your validation sets are within um, some ball. So you draw a random vector X from the equidistribution in the sphere. And once this X is generated, you can generate your trigger inputs such that this X prime, which I mentioned in the previous slide, is again alpha delta distant from this, um, this vector that you have randomly drawn. And then the next step is where you st set up your adversarial perturbation. So your adversarial perturbation is essentially going to be um, something that is uh, dependent on your activation function, which is G over here. And this adversarial perturbation has the following parameters. So this will be your weights for your um, for the neuron in which you're going to be attacking, and also um, the bias of um, the adversarial perturbation. And in order to get this weight and bias, you need to make sure, make sure that your parameters are kappa and your constant d are such that the following conditions um, are met. So um, in order to find if this algorithm is successful in an attack success rate, 
um, we have this theorem that tells us that um, if we consider the first algorithm and if we let the parameters be such that the following function, uh, which is dependent on gamma, delta, and alpha, is greater than zero, then um, the probability that this algorithm is successful, it, the probability that it has a higher success rate, and it also returns a solution to problem one, is bounded by uh, the following um, inequality uh, uh, over here. And as you can see that uh, this probability is going to be dependent on the validation, the uh, upper bound of your cardinality of the validation set, and also the dimension of um, the latent space. So we know the values of, uh, we know the function delta, we can just apply it in here, and we can find the following lower bound uh, which is expressed in this term of the probability that this uh, algorithm is going to be um, successful. So again, in addition to big M and N, we also see that it's dependent on the parameters um, gamma, delta, and alpha that the adversary um, uses. So from this theorem, we see that there's, um, there is some connection, some explicit connections between the trigger inputs intended parameters, the dimension of the latent space N, the accuracy of solving this nonlinear um, optimization problem, and also the vulnerability to the stealth attacks. Um, so the higher the dimension of the latent space in which you're able to solve this, um, uh, this problem over here, the higher the probability that you're going to have a success, a high uh, attack success rate um, for this um, algorithm. And using the parameters where delta is equal to one, gamma is sufficiently close to one, and alpha sufficiently close to zero, and then solving this um, problem over here, you can also be able to construct stealth attacks that are uh, close to one for any dimension. And this is because um, when alpha is equal to zero, our function here just becomes gamma delta. And then you can just choose values of alpha, de uh, of alpha and delta such that your probability here will be um, close to one. And um, so, I've mentioned before that whenever we are perturbing from the the map to perturbing from the map F to the attack map FA, we want the output to be such that um, on the trigger input it exceeds some uh, delta value. We can choose a rectified linear units such that when you choose um, values of the weights and the biases, you have a uh, equality here and having this equality here leads to the following reduction and we can pick values of uh, kappa and uh, values for the constant d so that so that we can get um, this desired output for um for the stealth attack and we also have cases for the rectified linear unit where epsilon is equal to zero uh, these are called zero tolerance attacks and that is when um there's not, not much change from the map F um, when you run the validation set into it. And then next I will talk um, about the case where you can have a targeted stealth attack. For the plain stealth attack, the attacks are arbitrary and the trigger input is also arbitrary, but we can focus on um, the case uh, whereby you have an attack which is uh, triggered by an input. Uh, but it's located within some target of um, interest or within some vicinity of the target of interest. So this um, means that we need to reformulate um, assumption one. And in assumption two, we just say that um, there exists a radius greater than zero such that um, we have the following addition um, to the latent representation of the target interest. Um, which is inside uh, the ball here. And um, for this assumption, again, it follows from assumption one, if we know 
our target of interest, and also if you know the latent representation of our target of interest as well. And one other thing is that um, this condition, which I've called two, um, it holds um, whenever we have a radius r prime, uh, which is a value of um, r, where um, our condition one holds from um, assumption one. So it'll be able to hold, if this is followed, then we are able to have the following radius where we have r prime plus uh, the magnitude um, over here. So quickly going to this targeted stealth attack. So the steps are similar to algorithm one, except what is different is your x uh, prime over here. You have an additional term here but you still draw your random vectors in the equidistribution of the sphere. Uh, you still need to have this following conditions um, uh, satisfied. And then you set your adversarial perturbation for your neuron. And what is different, again, are your weights and also uh, your um, biases. So Tukin et al. were able to implement um, this attack using the MINIST um, data set, and they considered three scenarios, two scenarios where you add a neural into the decision-making part of the neural network, and one where you replace a neuron by the um, attack uh, neuron. So for the first scenario, you have, you're adding your attack neuron and the output of your attack neuron goes, goes into the output of F. S uh, scenario two is similar, except an extra uh, neuron or node is added. And then in the third scenario, um, the, uh, a neuron is replaced by an attack neuron in which you can imp implement um, the second uh, algorithm. And just to quickly finish, um, they were able to find that these attacks were able to um, yield very high attack success rate. For the first scenario, um, it yielded an uh, attack success rate of 100%. And in the third scenario, um, it was um, 85%. Uh, so from their work, they were able to establish that there are three factors that contribute to the success of an attack. The dimension of the network's latent space, so the higher the dimension of the latent space, the higher the chances of a successful attack. So in order to minimize this, the best solution is just um, reduce this uh, dimension. And you can do that by having uh, dimensionality um, reduction approaches. So if you have a wide computational graph, you can take, um, you can deepen that graph and also you can make the graph narrow. Another one is the attack accuracy. So whenever you have, you find triggers which have a high accuracy, the, um, the probability of the success a, uh, of a successful attack is very high, so you can constrain this by having a high computational cost of finding this trigger. And the last, um, the last factor is over parametrization. Um, so these are inherent in the deep learning model, and when the deep learning model is shared freely and exchanged without control, uh, the a attacker um, is able to exploit this and cause um, attacks that can have a really high um, probability. And that's it. And yeah, these are the papers that I referenced um, on my presentation. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Are there any questions? Yes, Thomas. Okay. Hi, Wendy. Thank you for Hi. a very interesting talk. Um, so I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about the vectors by which someone actually might deploy some of these tax attacks. And because I know there's various attacks one can make on either um, source code or binaries of regular programs. Mm -hmm. So is it a similar situation and do 
um, mechanisms such as signing of executables offer a alternate approach to um, dealing with these attacks or do you have scenarios whereby um, machine learning systems are being shared and potentially modified in situations which are different from conventional code and executables? Yeah, um, so for this stealth attack, it's just attacking a neuron, right? So um, uh, basically, when you're drawing this um, in this step um, from the sphere, um, the main point of the attacker is to make sure that there are conditions that are held so that it doesn't cause any changes to the validation set. So it's mainly focused on um, the single uh, neuron um, attack. So where, where you're changing the weights and um, the biases of uh, a single neuron of a neural network. OK, but in order to utilize this attack, you'd be able you'd need to somehow switch out someone's codecs implementing the new yes, neural network um, to make. Yeah, so because the neural network, they have their weights and the biases in which they do the computation, right? So that is what I'm perturbing in this case. I'm changing uh, the computational process of the neuron by changing those activation functions and changing the, changing the weights and the biases of, of that neuron. So that's how I'm implementing that attack. OK, so I guess this could be deployed, for example, if someone wanted to had access to a neural network, they were, say, a co-developer on and wanted to change change it without the anyone noticing it. That's the kind of attack scenario. One can use, yeah. OK. Yes, there are other different ways as well. Because um, here I just chose a specific activation function. You can change that, or you can even add noise to your activation function. So it's just changing parameters of your neural network that this attack um, is focused on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Wendy, also for the answer. Are there any further questions? So Wendy, could you reflect a bit on your uh, own research uh, in the verifiability node and how the material you pre presented relates to your research? Yes. Um, so first I'll talk about um, the one that involves perturbing the training data. So this is the case um, that I'm working on with accessory injector strategy. So for example, if I'm working on the UAV firefighting drone and I want to perturb the train data so that the deep neural network um, for fire detection um, is misled in the classification of when something is fire or not fire. So I'm trying to um, have this attack on implemented um, on a deep neural network which will be integrated on um, a drone for fire detection. And all I need to do is use a pattern key and different pattern keys can be used. Let's say if you have images of somebody wearing um, a firefighter's helmet, and then when the drone sees that, then they'll misclassify if there's fire around that there isn't any fire. So that's one step in trying to perturb um, or trick the neural network into misclassification um, in fire uh, detection. So I can use this accessory, I'm using this accessory injected strategy um, for that part. And then for the second part, um, I'll be using the targeted um, algorithm that I've spoken here on how to um, change the weights and the biases of a neuron. So I will um, either add a neuron into the deep neural network and then um, use this algorithm to try and um, perturb the parameters of the AI so that there can be some misclassification going on um, on the AI system. So uh, those are the two approaches that um, I'm going to be using or I, mean, I am how... using in my work. So how would that perturbation help in the verification of the entire system? Uh... So by by seeing how it 
it works, we can be able to see like what parameters that needs to be dealt with to in order to minimize uh, this attacks, right? So um, uh, that is the point of trying to do the doing um, this attacks to make sure that to see if the system is susceptible to this attacks and uh, how we can minimize it if that is um, possible. Are you going to provide any guarantees after you, you analyze these perturbations? Uh. Yes, um, that's why I'll, I'll be looking at different scenarios, seeing the attack success rate, and then seeing what defenses I can make from them to, um, to minimize those uh, types of attacks going on. So you, you could kind of classify the attacks and saying that you have a very low probability of any attack from those types, any instance of attacks from those types to be successful? Yes. Okay, interesting. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions before we close this talk? If there are no further questions, let's wait for one more minute to see whether there are any further questions. We have four minutes to the end of the day. Okay, I guess there are no further questions. So um, in two weeks time, we'll have another instance of a verifiability talk. The, we have a change of, um, of, of uh, theme in our verifiability talk series for the coming couple of months, where uh, our young researchers will talk about their research and how, how they are making progress within the node. And in that um, context, and then following that theme, in two weeks' time, Thomas Wright will talk about his work on the semantic foundations that we are building for, for the verifiability framework. So, uh, Thomas, we are very much looking forward to your talk. Wendy, thank you very much for, for, for this uh, wonderful talk, and I uh, hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.